Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulli, and with me tonight is Father John Whiteford. Father John, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm good, and this is a topic that you emailed me about, and it's one that initially was pushed back considerably, but was moved up simply due to the increasing energies being expended by Joshua Shupin, who's a former Orthodox priest for those viewers and listeners who are not aware. And it's a, a very sad and troubling episode of someone's apostasy from the Orthodox Church and uh, uprooting not only just himself, but his whole family. And it's it's a personal tragedy as much as it's also something that's getting a lot of people's attention in the blogosphere and on YouTube. We're talking about combined now, Father, I would say about 20,000 hits between all the videos that he's now starting to do on this ever since he went public on his apostasy. And so it demanded a more urgent response uh, from someone who's orthodox to try to discuss this in a way that is both charitable and firm. I will say this from the onset that this video is intended, truly intended for Orthodox audiences. We're not going to be unpacking all these issues, uh, inferring that a Protestant viewer would not be aware of certain issues. And so this video is sincerely going to be for Orthodox audiences. Also, this show cannot possibly get to the bottom of every single thing Joshua Shooping will say for the next few days, next few weeks, next few months, next few years, because this appears to be something he's pursuing and we could expect the tell all book and, and uh, other things when he makes the rounds trying to now peddle what obviously is evangelism against Orthodox, as well as the online term. And I'll ask you in a second, cope for Protestants, which are now dealing more seriously with Orthodox claims in a way they never did before. So let me give you a moment maybe to reflect. And if you could, for all of our amusement, is cope the right word? I'm trying to think of the right word. It sounds so mean. So what exactly is is this presentation that we're seeing all over place with Joshua Shubin? Well, maybe to inoculate uh Protestants is what he's trying to do. The way you inoculate someone traditionally, not with the mRNA stuff, but traditionally <laughs> you, you give them a killed form of a virus and, uh, and, uh, and, and that helps them to build up an immunity. So if you have an apostate Orthodox priest that's on there telling them all the reasons why they shouldn't be Orthodox, I think the hope is that they'll be able to prevent people from becoming Orthodox. I I think that their evangelical evangelicalism is swirling down the toilet so fast that I'm not sure that uh, Joshua Shooping is going to be all that effective, but I'm sure he's going to get an audience because uh, I'm sh there, there are a lot of evangelical pastors and laity who see people leaving that would pr are probably going to be referring people to his channel. And it's, it's very disappointing because, you know, I've never met him in person, but I had a very lengthy conversation with him in 2020, uh, sometime during the lockdowns, and uh, he seemed like a, a a typical brother priest who, you know, was struggling with some of the stuff that a lot of priests have had to struggle with related to the lockdowns and frustrations with things that were being imposed upon him. But at that time, there was no mention of any spiritual struggles. The only thing that um, he's written about in the past, and I agree with him, I agreed with him to, to for the most part, is he had, had written extensively about how a lot of Orthodox writers, at least in the English speaking world, reject a lot of things that they say are Protestant, which are in fact taught by the fathers of the church. And specifically things like the atonement, the, the, the fact that Christ died in our place. Not that those are the only images that are used in scripture for what Christ did for our salvation, but they certainly are biblical images. But uh, to have him go to the point where he's now just aping 
uh, reform reformed apologetics. And what's kind of, what, one thing that's kind of strange is he went to the Christian Missionary Alliance, which I was raised Nazarene and, and uh, studied to be a Nazarene minister. And the Christian Missionary Alliance is a holiness denomination. So holiness denominations traditionally don't have a lot of time for Calvinists. Uh, if, if they spend any time reading Calvinists, it's usually to, to try to find ways to refute them because like the Orthodox, uh, people who are what are known as uh, Wesleyan Arminians, not Armenians, but Arminians, like it is in James Ar <laughs> Arminius, uh, they, uh, they believe that, that we have free will. They believe that God didn't just arbitrarily decide from all eternity who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. And they also believe that um, we're not saved by faith alone in the sense that we just have faith and our faith doesn't have to have uh, works that are, uh, that are working synergistically with the faith. And, and, and so on a lot of points, uh, not, and I, most Protestants, there are certain things about them that you could say are closer to us and other things that are further away. But when it comes to those particular issues, these people would be a lot closer to us than most Protestants. But he's still uh, reading off stuff that he's, he's finding in Reformed writers. He, he doesn't seem to be spending a lot of time reading Wesley and Armenian uh, theologians which is, it just seems very strange that he chose the Christian Missionary Alliance. If he had become a Presbyterian or something like that, or a Dutch Calvinist, it, it would have made a little bit more sense, uh, given, given the people that he seems to be drawn towards. And so it's, it's just very disappointing. And it's hard for me to understand how someone could have been a priest a couple of months ago and now seem to not have anything left of his orthodox sensibilities and to take the protestant evangelical side on every issue that they would typically disagree with the orthodox on i don't know how you make that kind of a transition i spoke to him about maybe two months ago i can't remember exactly when it was because i'd been given a heads up by a mutual friend that he was uh, headed in this direction and um and when i spoke to him the issue that seemed to be the big issue for him at that time was that he apparently having gone to St. Vladimir seminary only recently discovered that the Orthodox church believes that it really is the church. And, um, and that, uh, those outside of the Orthodox church really aren't in the church. And, and I don't know how you get a master's in divinity degree from an Orthodox seminary and not discover that. And this is not just because it's OCA. I mean, if you read Father George Florovsky's uh, document that was uh, uh, a talk he gave at a World Council of Churches session back in the 50s, uh, he basically explained to them, look, you're not part of the church and, and we are the church. He, he, he worded it in very nice nice ways and he didn't, he didn't say <laughs> everyone's going to hell that's not... Uh, that's not orthodox. Uh, he, he didn't pre, he, he didn't uh, presume to to sit in God's place and judge people, but uh, but he did make it clear that by membership in the World Council of Churches, the Orthodox churches that were participating were not implying that all these other groups were really churches in the full sense of the term. Uh, so this shouldn't have come as a surprise. But what has come as a surprise to me is that not only is that a big issue for him, but it seems like everything's a big issue for him now. I, I just, for the life of me, can't understand how you you convert from Protestantism, become an Orthodox priest, and then suddenly there's nothing the Orthodox Church teaches distinctively from the Protestants that you find compelling anymore you know, in, in such a short period of time. Yeah, there's personal details that don't quite add up. And without you and I divulging private conversations, because we never met him in person, but we've spoke to him privately. I've collaborated with him in two books and editing them for grammatical issues and whatnot. And so gleaning from all this, it's 
hard to piece this together in a way that fully makes sense. So, for example, when he published his book that uh, pretty much was a republishing of 1800s translations of the Council of Jerusalem 1672, the Catechism from St. Peter Mogila, the Catechism from St. Philip of Moscow, all these things would have been very obvious, and some of the issues just were not objectionable. He has footnotes in these books. You could see things where right now is pretty clear that, oh, he was heading in this aberrant direction. But in these other things, there's not even a faint whisper that these things are troubling. And so both of us are conference from Protestantism. Uh, you many years ago, so you might even forget how it's like to feel, even think like a Protestant. Uh, and luckily for myself, I have been always very open. So on my blog, you could follow me being a Protestant and slowly becoming Orthodox. And when I first started going to the Orthodox Church, because I'm an honest individual, it wasn't automatically everything Orthodoxy has is right and everything Protestantism has is wrong. That's very rare for at least a thoughtful convert to anything, right? It's you don't to instantly hate everything you used to believe and instantly embrace whatever is new. That's that's just not common. People generally work through things. And so it's very hard to understand how all of a sudden the canonical teaching of the Orthodox Church on uh, who is the church is now something that is so troublesome that prayers to the Theotokos and their content would all of a sudden be so troublesome. And we're going to get into more detail on that. But I guess to sum up my initial comments on this whole episode, it's very bizarre. It's very peculiar. And if there is no dishonesty, if this is not some sort of means to peddle a future book, to peddle a future YouTube channel where he becomes the resident Orthodox expert having been on the inside or whatever, it's if it's nothing self-serving like that, it is absurdly naive that anyone could have gone to seminary and been a priest and have published books and peer-reviewed academic articles and all these topics, and then all of a sudden these things are just so radically wrong and surprising at that. It, like So that's why I try to think of nicer, kinder words. And so for viewers aware, Joshua Shooping was invited several times to be part of the show. What it was originally supposed to be was a neutral interview where he got to explain himself to an Orthodox audience. And those who follow this channel know that there are entire episodes where I give a Protestant, go make your case. I've done it before. I'm sure I will do it again. In fact, I have a future episode with the other Paul where he's going to be making a case next month. So I do this all the time. Now, he was given this opportunity, and he was emphatic that he wants to focus on Protestants and not evangelize the Orthodox. Um, and so none of this is meant to blindside him or anything. We both tried as much as possible to let's have a real conversation and talk about this, not at surface level um, mass appeal to Protestants, but actually let's get into why this really occurred. So we're not wondering if it's peculiar or bizarre or, or absurdly naive or any of these things, but we don't have this opportunity. So ultimately we cannot give an answer to the audience why this bizarre course of events that occurred and why these bizarre things are being said. What we'll try to do instead is intelligently respond to some of the key points. Um, but I just want to say this, that what has occurred is an absolute tragedy. It appears in our common vernacular as a train wreck, but biblically speaking, it's a shipwreck. He has made a shipwreck of his faith. And it will, if he doesn't repent, it will destroy his soul as it would destroy any of our souls and any unrepentant sins we have would destroy our souls. And so this is a very serious matter, and it requires prayer for him and not hatred. It also requires Orthodox, when speaking about this issue, to show charity and not pettiness, because that has an effect on how people will perceive him and how people will perceive the church. So those are my initial comments before I get into any details. Father John, let me give you an opportunity to respond or clarify anything you would like to say. Well, 
and again, I'll, I just want to emphasize the fact that I've never met him in person. I've only talked to him when, when was a like, sort of like a Google Hangouts call or something like that, where we, it was a video chat, but the other one was a phone conversation. But, uh, but one thing, having pieced together a, a few things about his conversion and what happened after it, that I would say that should serve sort of as a cautionary tale for people uh, he converted to orthodoxy in the OCA and uh, no sooner had he converted than people were talking about him going to seminary. And um, I think that this was a mistake. Um, when I converted to orthodoxy, I just finished you know, my bachelor's degree at Southern Nazarene University in theology and um, I was told by the priest that baptized me that it would take me a minimum of a year. Uh, you know, I think he said two years, but he said, generally speaking, three uh, year. It, you should wait three years before you presume to start teaching anybody anything. Because he just explained that it takes time for your for you to acquire an orthodox way of thinking. And uh, so I didn't even teach a children's Sunday school class for the first three years that I was Orthodox. And um, the other mistake they made, unfortunately, is they sent him to St. Vladimir Seminary. Now I know people who've gone there that got, you know, that, that came out okay. So I'm not saying that, and I also know that the Dean there has been trying to turn the seminary in a more traditional direction, but this is not exactly the pillar of traditional Orthodoxy for of a seminary. If he'd been sent to, St. Teacons or to Jordanville, he might have turned out okay, even though he was going right off the bat from his conversion. Uh, but to go to a seminary where you have a lot of people who are modernist and don't have traditional views, uh, I'm sure also didn't help. So these are two things that I think people need to be careful about. When, when people are converting, they need to be told that there is a, a there, there, there is such a, a thing as having an orthodox mind, and it takes time to acquire it. You, you don't, you don't come out of the baptismal font and then automatically all of the ways that you view things are suddenly orthodox, and all the stuff that you learned as a Protestant has been corrected. Uh, you have to sort through these things, and it takes time. And uh, so, so I hope that people will be more careful in the future when you see someone converting. They may be very zealous. They may be very smart, but uh, but we ought not be trying to push them into uh, this kind of stuff too quickly. Yes, it's it's something I remember when I first uh, became a Christian. Then people start floating. Well, maybe you should go take these classes or seminary or whatever. And I just felt like, who am I? I'm going to get a real job. No offense to those who become clergy, but I think it's it's a good attitude that just because now you love God doesn't mean you go now teach everything, everyone right. about it, especially from a position like a pastor. Now, out of some full disclosure, because some names of area of uh, denomination stuff came up, my mother-in-law goes to a Christian Missionary Alliance church. Now, my mother-in-law goes to a Cambodian church. So for all the right. criticisms that... Oh, Orthodox or ultra ethnic. It's just extremely ironic that it's in my family situation. It's the Christian Missionary Alliance Church that is an ethnic enclave, and our Orthodox Church is diverse. <laughs> so it's. Uh, I'm sure I'm living in one of those strange exceptions, but in this household, that's how it works. And uh -oh. also, my godfather, uh, he went to St. Vlad's, and so like, mm. I there's good and bad everywhere, and. There's good things like you mentioned happening at St. Vlad's. Uh, Archbishop Michael in the OCA uh, has been doing good things. He, he teaches one class there on ethics he was at least doing in the past. So things are improving in the OCA and in many corners of the Orthodox Church all around. But it's uh, that doesn't mean there hasn't been scandalous things that Joshua Shooping heard there, things that no, like he claims again, this is his words. For example, someone who claims that they'd even believe in the resurrection that should not be, you know, that whoever said that would have Martin Luther King on his side, but that has no, no basis in an actual, you know, real Christian seminary. 
you know. Well, one, one of the seminary professors that's still there, as, as far as I know, Peter Butinov, uh, when they had a hire monk who uh, married another man, he, he congratulated him on Facebook. And so obviously you're not dealing with a guy who's got an orthodox way of thinking because if this hire monk had announced that he was marrying a woman, it still would have been a tragedy because he was a hire monk. He'd committed himself to the monastic lifestyle. And besides that, after you're ordained a priest, you can't get married regardless whether you're a, a, a monk or not. And uh, so this uh, Peter Batenev should have known better. And yet he congratulated him. So there are, there are people still associated with the seminary that have some pretty wild views. And I can understand someone being scandalized. Now, one other thing I, I should say is I, I, I want to believe that he is Joshua Shuping sincere. I, 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 so he certainly struck me that way when I spoke to him, although the, the, even though he always couches his videos right now as I don't mean to attack or offend Orthodox Christians. And then he goes and he's basically almost doing the Jack chick routine on the, on the Orthodox church. It's, it's, it's it, it strains my, uh, my, my faith and his sincerity, but I do think he's kidding himself. He, he thinks that he's going to be able to go into Christian missionary Alliance and he's still going to have some sort of a belief that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Christ. And, um, I used to see people come out of Nazarene seminaries or colleges that, as ministers that would try to go into Nazarene churches with that kind of, you know, try, trying to introduce some liturgical uh, views and, and maybe even a liturgy of some sort. And they are always very frustrated because, you know, the Nazarenes and the holiness movement is in, in general is where the word holy roller comes from. You know, we're not talking mm -hmm. about people who have, liturgical sensibilities. We're talking about people who jumping pews and rolling the aisles and barking like dogs and climbing up trees and houting, shouting and waving your hanky. This is the way you, you participate liturgically in, in, a, in the holiness movement traditionally. And so I think he barketh up the wrong tree and he's going to probably become very disillusioned. And I, I, I think he's probably going to come to regret what he's doing. But unfortunately, right now, with all the stuff that he's putting out there, he's kind of intellectually painting himself into a corner. It's pretty hard to walk back uh, renouncing orthodoxy and putting all of this stuff if he ever wanted to come back. I'm not, I, I certainly hope that he does it, but it's, it's hard for people to admit that they've been wrong more than once. I, you know, Winston Churchill started off as a Tory and then he went to the liberal party and then he went back to the Tory party and, uh, and uh, someone questioned him later about this. And he said, you know, cause when you switch parties in Britain, they call it ratting. He says, anyone could rat once, but it takes, you know, someone with you know, a genius or something like that to be able to rat twice. <laughs> um, so I, I hope that he, I hope that he comes back, but I, I just, the, the stuff that he's putting out there, I think is going to make it hard for him to do it emotionally. Uh, I, I would agree with you, but it's, it's something where I will read an email from a, a Protestant friend of mine. I've known for a few years and his take on it. And so what we'll do is we'll start unpacking some of the issues ever so briefly. And uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, people have probably already seen some of her replies in the comment section of uh, <laughs> some of his videos. Um, so that being said, here's some of the stuff that I that really jumped out uh, to me. Now, he made mention of how the seminary deceived him uh, that the Orthodox Church didn't teach the sub substitution, substitutionary atonement and exclusivism. And as time went on, he found, he wrote the book on substitutionary atonement, but also he came to grips with this idea of the exclusivist teaching the church. You touched on, Father, how someone really have to not, I'd say to the latter, you would have to not be paying attention, right? It's, but to the former, it's something where I think it's more understandable. I think J Joshua Shooping hears a lot of pop orthodox 
statements that, oh, we know where the church is, but we don't know where the church isn't. And statements such as, oh, well, there's people and great theologians to say maybe even um, Origen will be saved. And he was right. And other statements such as Orthodox don't believe in the atonement. They don't believe in the, the payment for the penalty for sins. You know, there's no such thing as payment and debts within Orthodoxy. And all these things are very misleading, just like it would be misleading to understand any of those things literally, that a debt is literally God being passionate and required, requiring, like with blood loss, blood to be, because he just has to get a, his rocks off on that or something like that. That would be clearly wrong as well. And so do you think, Father, that it is possible for someone who's gone to seminary just to be that people don't try that hard in class or professors don't do a good enough job explaining and there's just enough poor orthodox content out there out there that someone for a good five years could really not know that the the church has visible canonical institutional boundaries that the atonement has debt but we don't understand it literally as debt like are these things someone really like he can't be blamed. Maybe there's a real communication problem within orthodoxy. So, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think that on the question of the atonement issue, I could see how someone could be confused for quite some time because in the English speaking orthodox world, there's a lot of stuff that's commonly stated that just isn't true. And, and the, the thing of it is that the English speaking orthodox world is a very tiny part of the Orthodox Church as a whole now it probably has a disproportionate influence because English is the universal language uh, at, at this point in history. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, but, but the, in, in this little pond of English speaking Orthodox Christians, you do find a lot of the stuff commonly stated. Now, one of the things that's interesting, though, is that, for example, I remember Father Thomas Hopko going on and on about how we we reject the idea of the substitutionary atonement. And then the, this is a podcast was on ancient faith radio. And then in the middle of the podcast, he starts talking about some stuff in scripture that suggests that Christ died in his place. Of course, you say, of course, in some sense, Christ died in our place. <laughs> so, so even though he's dismissing all this stuff, he's acknowledging that we do really believe that Christ died in our place. And I think a lot of times what happens with Orthodox writers or speakers is they're reacting to some excesses in Protestant or Roman Catholic theology, and they're but but they're using a shotgun uh, response, and and instead of being more precise, uh, and, and and so for example, what we reject about Protestant views of atonement is this idea that God poured out His wrath on His Son. On the, in the crucifixion, because this, for one thing, suggests a division in the persons of the Trinity, and uh, it also suggests a, a passionate uh, attitude on the part of the Father, but the idea that Christ died to satisfy uh, justice is something you find, for example, in St. Philaret of Moscow's Catechism. Um, and uh, so, so these, but but all that say is a lot of times people are reacting to some excesses, but they're not precise in their responses. They they act like we reject more than we really do. You find the same thing with the, with talking about original sin. The phrase original sin, there's nothing wrong with it. It's used in the Council of Carthage that was affirmed at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, and so you can't say we don't believe in original sin. But what do most Orthodox writers or speakers mean when they say we don't believe in original sin. What they mean is we don't believe that you're born with inherited guilt. And you know what? The Wesleyan Holiness Movement doesn't believe you're born with original guilt either. And they affirm the doctrine of original sin. Uh, so there are Protestants that, that reject that too. Uh, it's not all, pro all Protestants don't teach that. And if you, and if you accept the idea that we're born with, with inherited guilt, then you'd also have to conclude that infants that die uh, go to hell and rose for all eternity because they are just as guilty as Adam uh, for his sin and had no opportunity to repent. And so 
obviously we as Orthodox Christians reject that, but original sin means that we're born with a predisposition to sin, but we're only actually guilty of the sins that we commit. That's, that's what the Orthodox Church teaches. So we need to stop saying we don't believe in original sin and say what we mean by original sin. That, that, so we need to start being more precise. And uh, the strange musings about how um, Orthodox are factious, they're not really united, while anyone could commune at a Protestant church, I just want to bring out one that's not even true. The right. Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, for example, does not, and he considers them sure brothers in Christ, they do not commune people from the ELCA. They don't believe in that. Right. And the second issue is the lower the sacramental theology of the Protestant church, the less important the Eucharist is. You don't. I've been to Protestant churches where you don't need to be baptized to commune. You could just walk in and you could commune. But they're not going to let you preach, right? A Baptist is not going to let a Pentecostal right. preach, who's not going to let a Lutheran preach, who's not going to let a uh, Wesleyan preach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden this argument that there's actual unity of Protestantism gets exposed for what it is. There's absolute disunity. When when do you hear the visiting Orthodox priest from wherever is not allowed in because they don't like what seminary he went to or his jurisdiction? That never happens because all people ultimately are concerned about in the Orthodox Church is whether they could commune, <laughs> right? That's the real issue, right. which is bad. You should commune the person. For most Protestants, communion is just crackers and grape juice. And, and so... It doesn't mean anything. It, 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 you know, they do it because, well, the Bible says we're supposed to do it, so let's get it over with. Uh, you know, in the Nazarene Church, you were supposed to take communion once a quarter, and so churches that paid attention to the rules would do this. But it always struck me as a very strange thing. I mean, they would read, you know, some passage from the gospel, and they would say, you know, if you're, if you're, if you have faith in Christ, you can participate. But if you don't believe that it's any more, anything more than crackers and grape juice, it doesn't. You, why is it that big of a deal? And the thing is, after you, you can tell what they really believe about the Eucharist by what they do after the fact. They'll throw out all the leftovers because they'll throw it in the trash. Yeah, uh, I've, I've seen it. Believe. I've seen the Lutheran Church dump it down the drain in the bathroom. Yep. Now, uh, I, certainly a pious Episcopalian wouldn't do that. So there are some Protestants that have a higher view of the Eucharist than that. But uh, but they, they weren't the ones that I was running with when I was growing up. Th those people thought it was crackers and grape juice and it didn't mean anything. Uh, other than, well, we have to do it. We're obeying scriptures. Christ said we're supposed to do this in remembrance of him, so let's remember him and do it. That That's all that it means. And quite frankly, when there is a... A Christian Missionary Alliance Church, and again, I have firsthand, uh, for, I know firsthand because, again, my mother goes to, one, goes to one and I've been to it, that when they have individually wrapped bread or matzah and individually sealed grape juice, you know, there's no, there's obviously no belief in the real presence. You could say, mm -hmm. oh, spiritually he's there in some Nestorian sort of way because you can't separate Christ's soul from his body. Um, right. You know, he's mysteriously there in some magical way. But the fact of the matter is they don't believe that he's really present. And so that downgrades the importance of Eucharistic communion. So in reality, of course, you could commune anyone. It's just food. You could have a meal with anybody where right. the rubber meets the road in the Gnostic Protestant heresy is intellectual, which is why who preaches matters. And they're not going to let anyone preach. I've been to Protestant churches where and I was in one for years where the pastor wouldn't let anyone preach, period, that he didn't handpick, and they had to be within the parish or within right. the, the congregation, right? And right. so literally, that is, if you want to think about it, that's like worse than even an old calendarist. <laughs> it's split off from everyone. He's, it's just this church, and everyone else is outside of that church. And so if... It, the sincerity of the sort of claims that the Orthodox are factious and that somehow the Protestants have more unity is, I believe, untenable. Because when it comes down to it, Orthodox could more easily go to any other Orthodox church and have any other validly ordained Orthodox priest serve and tolerate it than a Protestant will tolerate any of those different any of those differences. 
So I just don't think it's a, a good critique nor a true one. But let me move the topic real quick to one of his other claims, which is the sort of conspiracy theory that the church pretty much the wheels fell off between Constantine and Theodosius the Great, right? That it, the wheels fell off after Constantinople won. And what bothers me about this critique, it's, it's utterly ahistorical. You'll see in his articles that, for example, he claims that, oh, well, this sort of imperial liturgy is this mimicking stuff from the Roman court, and this shows that the Christian church became pretty much subjugated by this imperial religion that really wasn't Christian. And it just t it totally ignores the fact that the architecture of Christian churches, and this is what archaeologists know, is radically inconsistent with pagan Roman beliefs. This was clearly something different, including the liturgy, where the lady were taking part of. Now, for example, people don't know, in the pagan temples, you didn't enter the temple. That's where the priests presided. But in the nation of priests, which is us, the Orthodox Church, we all take part in the sacrifice. You as the priest would be presiding over it, but we all take part. That's why we're all within the temple. <laughs> this is a huge difference. And to ignore this is a radical ignorance of architecture because the early design of these churches were basilicas. And that actually came from Roman silver civil structures, not from Roman pagan temples. Right. The reason being is Roman civil structures, as they began as a republic, though they became an empire, existed because the idea was that the citizens had uh, had some sort of part to play within this system of government. And right, and so in the same sense, you take that architecture because people understand this shows everyone inside is invested in this. Right, and so. To anyone that's actually studied this, these critiques, they come off as radically bad Protestant critiques that make sense when you're up at 3 a.m. in the morning eating pizza when you're 19 years old. They don't come off from someone that is well studied in any of these things, that has at least been around the block a few times. That's why, as I said again, nothing against Josh Shupin as the individual, the man. I consider him as some sort of like a distant friend. I've worked with him and helped him. The issue is just it's how peculiar and bizarre these critiques are. You would not you would expect them from a nineteen year old, like I said, you would not expect them from someone that has studied any of these matters in any sort of detail. So well, this I idea really get... that this idea of dismissing the Orthodox Church as having been shaped by imperial uh, theology, you know, because it started with Constantine. Uh, when I was talking to him about this, I pointed out to him that the night he, you know he says he believes the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed says, I believe in one holy, one Catholic, holy Catholic and Catholic church. He wants to say, well, that means all the believers. And I told him that all you got to do is exegete that as a Protestant would do the Bible and ask yourself, what did the people who wrote that mean by it? And they have canons in those in the first two ecumenical councils in which they talked about how to receive schismatics and heretics back into the church. So clearly... Uh, they didn't think that uh, one holy Catholic and apostolic church included uh, the Donatist or included the Montanist or included all the other schismatic or heretical groups that were out there. Uh, but besides all of that, I pointed out to him, you can go back prior to Constantine and read St. Cyprian of Carthage's treatise on the unity of the church. And he states the doctrine of, of uh, orthodox ecclesiology about as strongly as anyone ever has. And he was a martyr uh, killed by the Romans before Constantine ever thought about converting to Christianity. Uh, and so it's just, it, it, it's, it's nonsense to say that this is some later development. It clearly is not. And orthodox liturgics, I mean, there could be that there are some vestments, some, some refinements in terms of how the church was, uh, uh, you, know, you know, maybe the, it is certainly true that bishops' vestments, I, I think, are based on the emperor's uh, attire. And that's something that happened actually after the fall of Constantinople because the. You, the, mean, that uh, crown, you mean that crown wasn't something from the first century AD? Uh, that kind of a mitre, I don't <laughs> believe, was. And, and particularly the sacos that bishops wear 
you, you can tell, you, you look at, at icons of, say, St. Nicholas, and he's not wearing a Sakos. He's wearing a Thelonian with an Omophorian. Uh, so the Omophorian is very ancient, but the, but bishops used to wear a Thelonian like a priest. And uh, But after the fall of Constantinople, when the, when the patriarch was made the ethnarch, which means the ruler of the ethnic group of, uh, of the rum which is the Romans, the Rum millet uh, in the Turkish uh, system, the Ottoman Empire, that made him, that means that he had a, a, not only a religious, but a secular position. And he took on the, the attire of the emperor uh, because basically he was now in the place of the emperor, the head of the Romans that were under the domination of the, the Ottoman Turks. And then other bishops eventually acquired or started wearing the same kind of vestments. But still, uh, you know, the Omophorian is the real symbol of the office of a bishop, and that's something that's remained constant. But the theology has not changed, and the, and the structure of the liturgy was clearly already in place. Uh, there's, there's nothing about the liturgy that changed when Constantine came in in terms of its essential structure, and it's universal. It, you find this in every part, any, any church that has roots in the ancient church, even groups that broke off, because of uh, heresy or whatever, like the uh, the uh, um, Nestorians or the Monophysites, or later the Roman Catholics, the, there's there's certain things that we all have in common, and a and a the basic structure of the liturgy is the same. The basic view that the Eucharist really is the body and blood of Christ is the same, and even the ecclesiology has traditionally been the same until prior to modern times when ecumenist thinking started to infect. Uh, various uh, churches, but the idea that there is only one church has always been something that's constant because we stated it in a creed. So you, the question you ask is, well, how do you know which one is which? How do you know who's got the real claim? Well, you have to look and see who changed. And when it came to the Nestorians, Nestorius rejected the the word Theotokos, even though it had been used for quite some time prior to his time. So he's the one that changed. He said, no, the, the, you can't call the mother of God, uh, the mother of God, the Theotokos, you have to call her Christotokos because she's only the mother of Christ, not the mother of God. And uh, so he, he was the one that made the change. And, he, and so the Nestorians were cut off from the church when they refused to repent. Although, well, it's, this creates an issue of the Joshua Shubin because during the interview, he made note that the Christology changed in the first few centuries of the church. And he said this as proof that supposedly then what the early church taught can't be trusted because they changed even Christology so early. Now, several problems with this. One, by that logic, if the Orthodox Christology now is correct, but it changed from what it was earlier, then does that make both him and us Christological heretics? It's a very peculiar argument. Right. Second, it's not historically true. I mean, I, I wrote on this. There was a pre-Nicene consensus on the Father, Son, Holy Spirit being God and of one substance or right. one essence. And so this is explicit in the writings of St. Uh, Aristides and St. Justin Martyr and St. Irenaeus, uh, right. St. Uh, Theophilus of Antioch, right? I just named almost all the important apologists of the second century. And they all taught that doctrine using the actual explicit Greek words. And so it's sad when these liberal arguments from the 1800s just get repeated repetitious, repetitiously and, and no one actually reads the primary sources. Right. These aren't even long ones, right? Aristides, St. Justin, you could read this in a day. It's like you could read almost everything in the second century outside of Irenaeus in one day. It's it's not a lot of stuff. Right. It's and if, I you, to bring if, you up one if you take the Monophysite controversy, uh, you, you have a lot of people be, these days that want to say it was all a big misunderstanding. But the problem with that view is that the misunderstanding was already cleared up prior to the Monophysite controversy. St. Cyril and St. John of Antioch, St. Cyril of Alexandria, came to terms and realized that they were using different terminology in different ways, but they were really saying the same thing. So St. Cyril acknowledged that when the Antiochians were talking about Christ having two natures, that it was correct in the way they were using the word nature, whereas he was using the word nature more along the lines of apostasis. Uh, and uh, it's, there's philosophical reasons for the different uses of the terms. 
But basically, he agreed with St. John of Antioch, and Dioscorus comes along after St. Cyril passes away, and uh, he represents an extremist faction among the uh, people in, in Alexandria, and he thinks that St. Cyril sold the store when he agreed with St. John of Antioch, and so he holds a false counsel and anathematizes everyone who confesses two natures. And so then the Fourth Ecumenical Council was held to say, no, that's not correct. We affirm what St. Cyril taught, but, but it's perfectly correct to say that Christ has two natures. As a matter of fact, in the sense that the, these words are used uh, properly, this is, this is what they mean. And we defined uh, you know, uh, Christology at the Fourth Ecumenical Council in a way that everybody accepts, with the exception of the Monophysites and the historians, all Protestants, all Roman Catholics. Uh, I should say all Protestants that, that are not uh, w whacked out ones, uh, even by Protestant standards. But uh, and you don't like holding uh, snakes and speaking in tongues? Well, like the United Pentecostals wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, go for all this stuff. I mean, well, actually, they would reject, they, they reject Trinitarian theology altogether. So I'm not sure exactly what they say about the two natures of Christ. Uh, m maybe they would say it in some sense. But anyway, that's, that's a, a rabbit trail. So, but the point of it is, is who changed at the Fourth Ecumenical Council? It wasn't the Orthodox. It was the Monophysites that were rejecting what St. Cyril taught, even though ever since they've always said that St. Cyril was the gold standard when it came to theology. Uh, and uh, so they reject their own uh, primary example of an Orthodox teacher because he agreed with us. Uh, so it's, if, you, if you study church history, these things are not that difficult to discern. And, uh, and if you look at the Roman Catholic Church today, I would say that just that, that's all you need to really do <laughs> to, to decide whether they went down the wrong path or not. Uh, but there are certainly other things that we could talk about there, but that's a whole other topic, too. But I, I just, for the life of me, don't understand how someone could have been a priest and not been bothered by any of this stuff for so long. And then now all of a sudden... Uh, you, you, you think that all these things are problems and, and that everything that happened after Constantine was, was all messed up. This reminds me of a Jack Chick uh, magazine in the Alberto series. If you don't know who Jack Chick is, you can Google him and you'll find out. But he's a he, he passed away, but he's a, he was a rabid anti-Catholic. And uh, in this one magazine, as, uh, as they were sort of talking about church history, they had this scene where these Christians were climbing up the side of a mountain as if they were escaping, you know, a, 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 a volcanic eruption or something like that. And, uh, and then one Christian turns back and says to the other one, Constantine's just declared Christianity the state religion. <laughs> well, the thing is, if you don't know anything about church history, you might believe that such a thing could have happened. But if you know that prior to Constantine, Christians were being uh, tortured to death, they were being flayed, they, they were being... When, when, the, when the Romans were being nice, they would only poke out one eye, hamstring them, and send them to work in a copper mine for the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, so you're going to tell me that these Christians went through all of this, but then Constantine comes on the scene and says, you know what, we're going to say that Christians can be allowed to function legally in, in the empire. Oh, well, we can't deal with that. We, we have to head for the hills so we can keep the King James Bible pure and, uh, and make sure that, uh, you know, none of this corruptions from these Catholics enter into our faith. No, uh, this not, never happened. It, this is all nonsense. And to have someone who ought to know better parroting this Constantine, you know, messed everything up kind of an argument when he ought to know better himself, I just don't get. For my speak for myself, it was, well, First 500 years, if it existed within the first 500 years, then it's legitimate. And then it started becoming clear at the time it wasn't really looking orthodox. He started looking Catholic, but just not quite all there. And they're like, okay, well, before Nicaea. But then you'd see stuff in the third century, like from St. Cyprian, teaching that uh, being outside the institutional boundaries of the church was a damnable sin. It's only salvation within the Catholic church. And he was speaking about novations. They weren't radically theologically different. It's the main thing was a disputed ordination, right? So the whole idea was a parallel bishopric. This was the real problem. Um, for in, in one of uh, Joshua Shuping's videos, he tries to say, "Well, Saint Cyprian only was reacting to people who were saying that once you fell away, you couldn't return to the church," and so he was trying to preserve the gospel as if that's the only thing that Saint Cyprian was responding to. 
in his treatise on the unity of the church. And it's just not true because there were people on the opposite extreme that were basically saying that if you, if you fell away during the persecutions that you didn't need to go through any penance and that you should be admitted immediately. And so he was responding to people on one extreme and uh, people on the other. And so you had schismatics on both sides of the spectrum. Plus there were other schismatics that he, he, he refers to. And his full treatise makes the point that it's impossible for the church to err. It's impossible for the church to be anything but one because Christ is the head of the church. The church is his body. So it's impossible that the entire church could fall into error. It's certainly possible that people in the church can fall into error. But when we fall into air, we're separating ourselves from the church in either small or big ways. Now, if we do so innocently, we're not, uh, you know, either, going to heaven is not passing a quiz and getting 100 uh, the, percent. The, the reason why heresy is a problem is not because you failed uh, to to get one question on a 100 question essay or, or quiz correct. The reason why heresy is a problem is you're giving people a bum steer on the road to salvation. When you reject the correction of the church, you're you're causing division in the church. And so therefore, the church has to separate you uh, from its body because you're now like a cancer that, that, that is attacking the body. And so, so for the health of the body of the church, the church has to preserve itself. It's, it, it's not just because we, we want everyone to be to be smart and well-read and right. We want people to be humble and the church is an org organism. It's not just an organization. And uh, if you have the humility, uh, there, there's lots of old babushki that probably have a lot of, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of old grandpas too that have theology that's, that's incorrect. But if they're pious and if they're humble and, they're, and they say something that's heretical and their priest says, you know what, that's incorrect they wouldn't respond arrogantly and say, oh, no, I'm going to cling to this teaching regardless of what the church says. They would humbly accept the correction and move on. So it's not simply being an error that's the problem. It's the refusal to be corrected that, that is the problem. And Saint, 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 you cannot say that St. Cyprian uh, would have accepted all these Protestant denominations and said, you know what, they're okay. You know, the novations... You know, but they were a little bit over the top. And these people who wanted to accept lapsed people back without any penance, these people were over the top. But, you know, the Christian Missionary Alliance, hey, they're OK. All these other denominations, they're OK. There's no way that St. Cyprian no, no. would accept these it, groups. It's a radically ignorant argument because St. Cyprian had a very public dispute over a matter of doctrine with St. Stephen of Rome, the Pope. Right. And within one of these documents in second paragraph epistle 75 uh saint cyprian writes that peter also showing this set forth that the church is one and that only they who are in the church can be baptized and said in the noke of noah uh, ark of noah there is few eight souls were saved by water the like figure were unto even baptism shall save you proving and attesting that the one ark of noah was a type of the one church if then in that baptism the world thus expiated and purified he was not in the Ark of Noah could be saved by water. He was not in the church to which alone baptism is granted can also now be quickened by baptism. So he not only believed that salvation is only within institutional boundaries of that church, is that the sacraments and grace was only within that church. I mean, that, right. I mean, you can't intelligently talk about Cyprian. That's probably the main point of contention in this theology that has persisted over the ages, and we still debate over it, is how exclusivist saint cyprian was and so to argue that he wasn't is just simply untenable and, and, also and to say issue, that, that view is somehow influenced by roman imperial influences is ridiculous no so it, it, it goes back a lot earlier than saint cyprian and and this is what i was struggling with huh? was you saw it in saint cyprian so i go okay if it's in the first two centuries of the church it's legitimate and then he's seen saint Irenaeus. saint Irenaeus says there's no re reformation of any great importance that could be uh, accomplished through schism. We have then, well, all right, let's get to the Apostolic Fathers. You get to St. Ignatius of Antioch. And he said, well, any of those who follow someone into schism, there will be no salvation. Yeah, and no one who follows another into a schism will inherit the kingdom of God. No one who, who holds heretical doctrines is on the side of the passion. 
when I read St. Ignatius of Antioch's epistles, that's when I decided I could no longer be a Protestant. I didn't know what I was going to be at that point, but I knew I didn't belong in the same church that he did. And I figured since he was a disciple of the Apostle John, he would have to have been in the right one and I would have to be in the wrong one. And, you know, uh, on Ortland's video, Shoot Bean's videos, no one's responding to any of these. And what was the clincher for myself, because how stubborn and idiotic I am, was in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it gives a list of sins. Those who do these shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Greek word for sects or denominations, erases, was there. And so it's in the scriptures. It's in every single early father and just keeps going from there. The church has always been exclusivist because there's only one physical body of Christ. And he's right now the right, right. hand of the father. And so everything is consistent with this. And so there's right. not a good response to this. And everyone has ignored it. Why does no one address this? It's in the scriptures. It's in every single father. There is no, you have to wait to Tychonius of Carthage in, in St. Augustine's time. And he was a Donat, he was a schismatic from the Donatists. He was even amongst the Donatists to find anyone who teaches any doctrine like the invisible church. And so and you read the epistles of St. John, the apostle. And, uh, you know, I, I can't remember off the top of my head the name of the person, but there was, I think it was Diotrephes. There was a man who rejected his authority. Yep, Third John. And if, if, uh, if St. John the Apostle took the, the shooping view of the church, he would say, you know what, that, that guy, he may, he may be, uh, you know, a, a bit wrong on a few things, but he still believes in Jesus. So he's okay. He's still part of the same church. We we'll just have to pray for him. But that's not what he said. You know, he, he, he obviously consider, he considered this person to be uh, in schism from the church and that he was obligated to recognize his authority. Uh, and, and so there's there's never anything. There's never any indication in the New Testament itself that doctrinal diversity was a thing or that that was acceptable or that denominational diversity was a thing or that that was acceptable. Never. And, and in fact, St. Paul denied he was from the sect of the, uh, the what they call a sect, he says in Acts chapter 24. Christianity is right. not a sect. The Orthodox Church is not a sect. It is the body of Christ. And, and another thing I would point division. out about a lot of uh, Joshua Shuping's argumentation is he's essentially accusing the Orthodox Church of idolatry and paganism right and left. And so... If what he's saying is really true, he can't say that we're just brothers in Christ, that we should all consider ourselves to be part of one big happy family. You know, what does St. Paul say? You know, what fellowship hath light with darkness? You can't drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. So if we're engaged, if we're idolaters, then he can't consider us to be brothers. There's no way. So so he he either really believes that we're idolaters or he really doesn't. But if he really believes that we're idolaters, he can't believe that we're really Christians. And again, this creates a big problem for Protestants because they, they will call St. Augustine, one of their great teachers, and they say laudable things about them, but they're aware that they venerated saints and the, and the martyrs and things like that. And so it's just, well, like, well, it was bad, but they were so faithful or something like that. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So you right. can be sort of pagan. You know, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I want to make this point before I forget. With all the accusations that the Orthodox Church was a sacralist institution set up by the Roman Empire. And so it's this imperial religion. It's not authentic Christianity. What's that mean of Protestantism? Protestantism began as sacralist institutions. Let's just look at this very basically. Anglican Church, England. Northern Germany, Lutheran, Scandinavia, Lutheran, um, the Netherlands, right? Uh, Dutch Reformed, you know, uh, the Swiss, I forget what the name of their Reformed church was. If you know, in Europe, in old Europe, you can literally figure out geography in what denomination, Protestant denomination they are. They're, they're no less sacralist than the Orthodox Church or, or the Roman Catholic Church or any sort of church they want to say sacralist. So what people consider Protestantism today is actually in development in the United States. Why? Because all of the religious heretics were kicked out of England. They went to America and they had separate colonies where they could all be. And some colonies like Massachusetts was legal not to be their religion. So they took that with them. But what prevailed in the United States was something very different where there would be no state religion. There'd be separation church or state doesn't mean no prayer in school. 
Separation church and state means that there is no institutional religion paid for by the government because that's what pretty much every Protestant country had. And they wanted to avoid that in the United States. So Protestantism, as Joshua Shubin understands, is an anarchism because it's not actual Protestantism. Luther wasn't, Luther wasn't that sort of Protestant. King Henry VIII wasn't that sort of Protestant. John Calvin was not that sort of Protestant. No Puritan was that sort of Protestant. That Protestant existed after the first Great Awakening in the United States. It's really what the shopping mall Protestantism, which people think is true, lovey-dovey, all-encompassing Christianity and everything else that's exclusive as hogwash garbage invented by the Roman Empire, that existed because the advent of capitalism, where you could have, compete, and whoever could preach the best and build the best church. I mean, if that's really how it works in some respects, well, you could convert a lot more people to these capitalist methods, but they're not historically Christian. It's just a fact. It just, capitalism didn't exist. These open borders didn't exist. These way of doing things didn't exist. So Protestantism's origins are even more secularist because they began as state churches than the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church continues to exist in countries where it's not the state institution in any way, like in Lebanon, in, in uh, Syria, in Jordan, in countries like this. And so just what Joshua Shuping says is, utterly ahistorical. And it, it, like I said, it's smart for a 19-year-old eating pizza at 3 a.m. in the morning, but for anyone the least bit educated, it's a nonsensical argument. It's not something, it's irresponsible to peddle the Protestants, which is why I lack a better term than cope. It's like trying to get ignorant people to feel good about themselves. Oh, this priest knows better. All that stuff I hear from Jay Dyer, or from Father John Whiteford or whoever's doing these popular YouTube videos, I don't have to regard this because this guy speaking my level and everything he says must be true because he came from the Orthodox Church. But I think he owes an apology to his Protestant viewers about how historically inaccurate he is because these things are extremely silly is a nice way to put it. Right. So um, believe it or not, I'll try to move to another topic unless you have any <laughs> comments. <laughs> All right, so you know what? Let's let's talk about this for a second, which is he touched on the idea that the separate office of the bishopric is an innovation, right? Like, oh, they're all elders, so Protestants actually have apostolic succession. Uh, what are your comments on that, Father? Well, it's a ridiculous argument because in the early church, you had three levels of uh, clergy. You had apostles, and then you had what were called uh, presbyters and also interchangeably uh, a bis bishops or episcopoi or, uh, or episcopi if you were doing it Greek, the Greek style, and then uh, deacons. So already in the St. Ignatius of Antioch's epistles, the word bishop is used exclusively for that top tier. That's because St. Ignatius is writing after all the apostles have reposed and the apostles had successors. This is a very clear teaching of the earliest uh, fathers of the church. And, uh, and so their success for their successors, even though we, we call bishops an apostolic office and, and, and there are a lot of things that we say they're successors of the apostles. So we recognize that that's the position that they're in, but out of respect for the original apostles, we don't talk about, you know, our bishops as being apostle so-and-so. We call them bishop or archbishop or metropolitan or whatever. Uh, so th it's the same three levels. And and uh, to, to try to say that, oh, well, in the early church, they had no such distinction. So the, the terminology developed, but the offices did not develop at all. The offices are exactly the same as you find in the book of Acts. And... Another issue that people ignore is this existed in Judaism. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found out that the community there was read uh, was led by a mevakir, which is Hebrew for literally means bishop. And then they had priests, and then they had everyone else. And so you had this differentiation with the same names within Judaism. Um, right. I have a series of articles where I argue even the Sanhedrin system was something consistent with uh, analogous bishopric, priesthood, and then 
below. So this comes from Judaism. It's there's some been real bad speculation for those who follow like these scholars on this that like well this arose from the these Roman guild systems and stuff that sounds good in paper, but right. it's not really close to the Roman guild system. It's exactly the system that you see in Judaism. So not the obviously not the uh, the Sadducee controlled high priesthood though there's obviously analogous differentiations with that as well. But specifically what you see in, I believe, the Sanhedrin system and what you see in the uh, the Essenes. And so you can't just take in isolation Acts chapter 20 and Philippians chapter 1, where it speaks of several overseers, and then say, well, that settles it. That means all the priests were bishops. doesn't say that, though. Right? Ephesus itself probably had at least 100,000 people. It's in a... City today, you could have more than one Orthodox bishop in a city of 100,000 people, especially when it was a brand new burgeoning movement. There's a there's more that can be said in the city of Philippi because it's much smaller. But again, how do you take one thing in isolation and then infer what he does, which you can't when it's radically inconsistent with Judaism? So with what we have before Christianity and what we have with St. Ignatius immediately after Christianity, where there's no... Right. There's no lack of clarity that there was this three-tiered system, as you point out. Yeah, I would say that it's pretty. It's a pretty safe bet that if you have a problem with what St. Ignatius of Antioch says, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, that you're probably just wrong. You know, if, if, if the apostles were such poor teachers that they were unable to convey the most basic teachings about what the church is and how it functions to their immediate disciples, then what hope do, does anybody have? I mean, it's just, you, you oh, it to, devolves into full Mormonism, full great right. apostasy. Right? That That's the problem. Yeah. Now, now right. let me ask you this, Father. It, one thing that kind of really shook me is how one, not only, it's one thing you change your mind, right? What's the real tragedy is the falling out of love. Not just with this, something like an institution, right? It's like saying, I used to love America. Now I don't believe in what America represents or something like that. Let's talk about people. When you venerate the Theotokos, you venerate your patron saint, you venerate the saints. How do you just wake up one day? They don't mean anything to you anymore. You don't love them anymore. Like that to me is this is the unsaid tragedy in this because until you grow closer to any of the saints through venerating them, you know, I remember as a president, they mean nothing to you. Right. And so, I mean, you've been around the block for a long time. You've probably seen wackier things than this over the decades. So my question to you is like, what's what usually is going through someone's head? How does that happen? They just they don't care about the saints anymore. They don't venerate the Theotokos anymore. How do you how do you go to 60 to zero instead of zero to 60? That I don't get. You know, I've talked to a lot of people who were in the process of converting about you know the issues that they've had i i i've seen people who fall away after they become orthodox and they just don't believe in anything or they don't practice uh, but i a lot of people who when they convert to orthodoxy they tell me that this is the last stop on the train if, if this isn't true then i don't know that there is anything true so it'd make more sense to me if somebody just decided i don't believe any of it anymore than, than to go back to Protestant evangelicalism after you've been Orthodox. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, and it, to me, the, the church that I grew up in doesn't even exist anymore. I, I couldn't find a Nazarene church that has church services like I knew as a child or that uh, even believes the same way that, that that I remember being taught as a child is is a different denomination now, and that's true of just about any evangelicalism. And you know, one thing I should point out before you know, while I'm thinking about it is he he likes to talk about divisions within orthodoxy. We argue about stuff. Okay, we have some modernist and ecumenist, but you know, you take outside of a few really whacked out people, the issues that the orthodox people typically argue about compared to the kind of stuff that, that goes on in Protestantism, they're small potatoes. Even just within Lutheranism, you've got people who have tranny bishops 
uh, you know, hardly believe in God anymore. They're pro homosexual or don't they believe in the God. Especially in fire. They don't believe that Christ rose from the dead. And then you've, you've got very conservative Lutherans. And this is just in one branch of Protestantism. And then you, you've got Protestants like what I was raised that believe that God didn't decide who was going to go to hell from all eternity just for, for arbitrary reasons. But then you've got Protestants that really do believe that, like the Calvin, the real five-point Calvinists. You're talking about a very different God when you're talking about a God A who, who, who judges people and basically offers salvation to everyone but judges them based on their response. And then God B, who from all eternity decided that, you know, the vast majority of, hum- of the human race was just going to go to hell and burn for all eternity to, to show how glorious he is. You know, that that's a very different God between those two. And we're talking there only about the traditional <laughs> expressions of these Protestant groups, not to mention all the variations and the whacked out liberals. Uh, all the secularism that we see in the world, in the Western world, this is all the result of Protestantism. Protestantism produced the skepticism and the secularism that we see today. Uh, and and uh, Protestantism was the religious expression of the Enlightenment. And it basically, it was sort of like the scaffolding that was necessary to create the secular, atheistic, uh, materialistic world that we inhabit today. Uh, so I'll... I'll Pro, there's nothing in Protestantism that ought to be appealing to anybody who who believes in God and is looking for truth. And the problems that we have, we have problems in the Orthodox Church because we have human beings in the Orthodox Church. But we don't have those kinds of problems typically. You know, th- there's a few whacked out people on the periphery, but you're not going to find bishops and clergy, priests, churches where people believe that Christ really didn't rise from the dead, or that. Uh, you know, or that we ought to have uh, tranny bishops, or that uh, you know uh, that God did decide he was going to go to hell from all eternity. But you don't find these kinds of variations in the Orthodox Church. Now, on the issue of Mariology, it did seem to me, as I alluded to when this video started, that how bizarre he was shocked by these prayers. You know, there's. Like, for example, he didn't name this in this prayer, but there, one of the prayers, forget which, I think it's in the, the three canons in the St. Econ's book, but it calls that they took us my only hope, right? And so, yeah, we say, you know, most holy they took us, save us. But like, you could say, save me when you fall off a boat. You know, it's, that's not the big deal. But like, when it comes to like, my only hope and stuff like that, he didn't hammer on, I think, some stronger languages on these prayers. Well, on that particular line, uh, that that phrase is used, I think, in the evening prayers, and it's immediately followed by, my hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection is the Holy Spirit. Almost Holy Spirit. So when it says you're my only hope, it doesn't mean you're exclusively my only hope, but that I'm putting my hope in you. you know, that it, It's sort of like when uh, Princess Leia said, Obi-Wan Kenobi, help me. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. And then she put the CD into R2-D2, <laughs> which shows you R2-D2, there's a little uh, bit of hope in that droid. <laughs> you know, basically, it's an expression of desperation when you say that you're my only hope. But I don't think Princess Leia thought that if Obi-Wan Kenobi was uh, killed by a lightsaber the next day, that she would have no more hope left. It's Yeah, it's it seems to me, how could someone learn the Orthodox prayers and not understand the, how the panegyric character that they have, right? There's it's, a lot of hyperbole even in, in the Bible, and it, it's it's a thing. And it's also, it's particularly Eastern thing. And uh, when I became Orthodox, I remember hearing, I think I might have even told you the story before, but when my uh, first daughter was born, there was this old Russian woman yeah. <laughs> who had actually been born in China. And, and she, I remember her saying, Oh, she's so beautiful. You must have another one. I beg of you. And, <laughs> and, and, and you would never hear an American talk like that. I mean, this is, uh, this is very ex- exaggerated. But she was trying to say, you have a beautiful daughter. I hope you have another child. But, you know, she was doing it in an exaggerated way because that's how some people speak. And some, some cultures, this is more commonly the way people express themselves. 
Yeah, and it's well, and we have in stuff like this in English where you know someone asks, "Would you like to have a drink when they come to your house?" You're supposed to say no, and then they ask again, "No, I'm really fine." When they ask a third time, you know they really mean it, and then you can say yes at that point. So it's right. like we become conversant in these things within our own societal context. And there's no way you become orthodox other than a priest and just realize these prayers are like this. I mean, there's there's prayers that say that God's our only hope. So like, are they just an utter contradiction or there's something in this genre we have to understand that it just lauds praise and, and uses these injunctions like this. What, what, so, what you just mentioned reminds me of a funny story from a priest that I know who he was born in Sudan and his father was Syrian and his mother was Italian. And he was used to the Arab culture primarily, but he went to visit his Italian relatives. And he was used to Arab women who would say, oh, you must eat another bite, uh, you know, for the sake of, uh, you know, Saint, you know, Andrew, please, please, you know, and they beg you to eat. And you say, no, 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 no. And then you, you finally you capitulate, oh yes, I'll eat. So he was over to the Italian relatives and, and they, they were trying to get him to eat. And he said, oh, no, no, it's okay. I don't need any more. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then he was, he was like, oh, my goodness, they're taking me literally. <laughs> what Italians are these? I want to, it's, that's not my Italian upbringing, but yeah, I, I get the point. You know, it's, uh, it's for some, for hospitality is to beg, you know, to beg you like this. And you don't right. really mean it unless you beg enough. And so, right. Right. you know, the scriptures speak of, you know, you, know, you knock on the door because, right, the, even the person, uh, I forget, the, the the unjust judge, he was wearied by how much she asked. And so the style of our prayers are like that, right? Like in good right. Hebrew style, it's just incessantly ask God, ask God, ask God, because it's from a society where if you want something, you got to do that. The squeaky wheel gets right. the grease. Right. Uh, and so the bottom line of it is if you, if you say that asking the saints for their prayers, or even when we say we're asking the mother of God to help us, we know that she's not operating on her own juices and power, but that this is all through her prayers and that she, she's anything that she's able to do is by God's grace, by God's permission. Uh, but, but if you're, if you're going to say that asking the saints for their prayers is somehow taking something away from Christ's role as the one mediator, then you'd also have to say, we shouldn't ask anybody to pray for us. And yet this is, contrary to what St. Paul teaches us in the New Testament itself. And so the, the the only other thing you can object to is, well, they're dead. They're not alive. So how can you ask for their prayers? Well, Christ said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures and the power of God. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. We don't believe that the, the saints are, are, are really uh, dead. We believe that they're alive. And uh, St. Paul tells us in the epistle of the Hebrews, chapter 13, that one of the unique features of the New Testament is that we we unlike uh, the Old Testament where they went to uh, Mount Sinai and they were uh, there was a, a sense of fear and trembling, but when they came to the New Covenant, the New the, to Zion, one of the things that we come to are the spirits of just men made perfect. What does it mean? This is a feature, and, and when I made this comment on one of his video uh, comment sections. Someone said, well, that just means that we're following the examples of the saints. We have a great cloud of witnesses. Well, you know what? They had the great cloud of witnesses in the Old Testament. If you read Hebrews 11, those are all Old Testament saints. And so that's not a feature of the New Testament if we're just talking about the example of holy men of the Old Testament. But there's something that happened in the New Testament, and I would say it's because Christ emptied Hades of all the righteous dead, and they're now uh, with Christ and reigning with him. As St. Paul tells us, they're not just sitting around watching God reign. They're reigning with him. God's delegating things to them. They have things to do, which is why we can ask them to help us. Uh, but uh, but we are coming to the spirits of just men made perfect in the New Testament because there's something that's changed about our relationship with the spirit of just men made perfect. And, you know, quite frankly, I think that it's, he was in Pennsylvania, and I don't know about, you know, the Russian scene down where you are, but in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of, uh, they're affectionately called Lemkos. That's an inside joke. Right. You know, a lot of people from the Carpathian Mountains, the Rusins, right. and they have a peculiar practice in their uh, confession where when you say, I confess to God and to the most holy Theotokos, 
uh, and to the saints or something like that. And I remember asking my priest, because uh, I went to uh, a Ukrainian church where they you read the stock confession, you have to start with, I confess to God and the Theotokos. I'm like, this sounds peculiar to me. You confess to the saint, they don't forgive sins. It's like, yeah, it only really exists amongst like pretty much those in the Carpathian Mountains. The rest of the Orthodox Church doesn't have it in their service books right. or anything. And so I bring this up because that's something that someone like Joshua Shupin should have been aware of that there are some of these, you know, these excessive verbiages, particularly like even the order of confession and stuff that would have been local in Pennsylvania. So it's again, very peculiar, very bizarre. It's hard to explain rationally though. It doesn't defy the laws of thermodynamics or something that to somehow none of this ever was in front of him ever, or he was right. paying attention when it happens or, or whatnot. So we want to take a, Speaking a charitable of the interpretation. Of customs, it's interesting that he keeps beginning his videos by saying glory to Jesus Christ, which is a Carpathia Russian custom. Uh, and glory forever. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're turning your back on the Orthodox Church uh, and you consider it all to be pagan imperial uh, nonsense that people need to depart from, then you know, stop. Uh, you know, acting like you're 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 still hanging on to some of it. You know, just go back to being a Protestant and be done with it. And and really, it, it, what he ought to be doing is spending some time just reflecting on where he wants to go in life and not teaching anybody anything. Uh, because I, I just don't know how you can can be the expert on why someone should be Orthodox when you were, uh, you know, apparently a perfectly happy Orthodox Christian within the last year. Yeah, it's uh, so it's just it's a very peculiar situation, especially to be so out about it instead of embarrassed yeah. or, or ashamed. If you had a Damascus Road experience that he could point to, you know, then, then maybe I could buy that there's this radical change that happened overnight. But uh, you know, he's not he's not ad admitted at least to having such an experience. Well, which would be keeping with humility, right? Yeah. <laughs> you would you would not do that. But like yeah, on the issue of the intercession of the saints. Like, for example, in 2 Maccabees chapter 15, so this is a, a pre-Christian source, is from a Jewish source. Um, it says that this is a man who loves the family of Israel and prays much for the people in the holy city, Jeremiah, the prophet of God. Right. Jeremiah stretched out his right hand and gave the Judas a golden sword as he gave it. He addressed him thus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, the idea that saints intercede is not some sort of later pagan thing. I mean, this is a mainstream Jewish source. There, There's... No. It's in the book of Revelation, too. I mean, it, but you know what I mean? It's like all over the place. If flat out says he's praying, you can't say, oh, well, the, the martyrs really aren't praying heaven. I've heard some weird explanations of Revelation chapter 6. But, I mean, it says right there he prays for the people of God, Jeremiah the prophet, right? So it's like this is obvious stuff to pretty much everyone other than Protestant polemicists. Uh, I want to make this note, though, which is when he claims that the stuff and veneration practices Borders with idolatry, meaning it's not quite, but maybe it is or, or whatever. Um, what I find confusing is I never found an Orthodox person that ever confused any of the saints as demigods, right? So it's like for, for saying, well, this language might not be wrong, but it's unsafe. It's dangerous. Well, that's only true if there's people getting hurt by it, you know, Orthodox people. They're like the only people I see bothered by it are Protestants, heterodox people, which makes sense. They're not Orthodox. They don't understand it. And so like you made the comment earlier, you know, it should be at least three years. Let it marinate. I was told, and I believe it, that it takes 10 years to really thoroughly become Orthodox, to, to really uh, authentically love your patron saint, love your guardian angel. I'm not all there yet. I've been Orthodox for, I don't know, four years or something. Uh, you know, it's I'm a beginner speaking for myself. And so that's why it's good to, that's why I, I try to stick with topics of history. I can read a history book and not believe in any of it, but it's to really understand Orthodox doctrine, really understand what you're doing in the church. It takes years. It could take a decade. It's not something someone should jump into or out of just because something doesn't make full sense at the moment right. or exactly satisfies them. But being that we're on that note, let's talk a little bit about the issue of icons uh, I think his video on iconology was pretty long, was actually some more well-researched, though for me, 
because I've had whole videos of Protestants doing very similar presentations. It was, you know, kind of a yawn fest, not anything personal to him. It's just I, I've heard this a bunch of right. times. So what are your reflections on that before I give my own on what he was saying about a, a, a kind of dulia? Well, uh, the biggest problem with it is he, his position that he wants to argue is the correct one is to say, well, we can have icons, but we shouldn't venerate them. But the thing is, is if you look at the iconoclastic examples that you can find in church history, some of which are debatable in terms of their authenticity, uh, the question was never, you can have icons, but you can't venerate them. The question was always, either you can have them or you can't have them. Because if they're idols, uh, if the second commandment applies to icons, and that means you cannot make them, you cannot bow to them, you cannot worship them. Now we already know we can't worship an icon, but we can we can venerate it. But uh, uh, but if you're going to say you can make them, then that means you're already not talking about what the second commandment is talking about. And we know that the second commandment doesn't apply to all images because a chapter or two later. Moses is commanded to make images of cherubim. So obviously there are images that are acceptable and there are images that are not acceptable. And the Hebrew word uh, for graven images, as it's translated in the King James Version, is the word pestle. And that word is never used of anything other than a pagan idol. It's never used of any of the images that you find that, that God commands people to make. It's a particular kind of an image. And in the Greek Septuagint, the word is translated as an idol, eidolon. Uh, and, and so that's clearly what's being talked about there. So the iconoclast didn't have a problem with venerating holy things. They just said you shouldn't have icons. Uh, but they, they actually venerated the cross. They venerated relics. Uh, so the idea of making the sign of the cross and bowing and kissing something wasn't what they got hung up on. And... Uh, uh, Jews kiss all kinds of holy things. Every time they walk in or out of the door of their house, they have a, a, a an Orthodox Jew has a mezuzah on his the doorpost, and he touches his fingers and he touches the mezuzah as he walks in or out, because the mezuzah has a, 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 some of the scriptures that talk about you should write this on the doorpost, you should bind it to your foreheads. They kiss their prayer books before they read them and after they read them. Uh, they kiss their prayer shawls as they put them on. They kiss the phylacteries before they put them on. They kiss a Torah scroll before they read it. Uh, so kissing holy things, uh, showing honor to holy things, has never been a problem that even Orthodox Jews have. And if we're talking about uh, ancient Judaism, images were not a problem. We have archaeological evidence from all over the Holy Land of synagogues that had images in them. Uh, and Dora Europus is one of the best preserved synagogues, and it's covered from floor to ceiling with uh, icons. And uh, icons that have very similar style to Orthodox iconography, as a matter of fact, in many respects. And so it, it's a very stylistic style of iconography. It's not naturalistic like Greco-Roman art. And uh, so Jews didn't have a problem with having images. Uh, they had a problem with idols, and then you had a particular sect of, of Judaism that eventually rejected having any kind of images in the synagogue at all, uh, and so that's the Judaism that we see today, but that's not the only type of Judaism that existed in the ancient uh, world. And, the, and to be clear, that came after Islam. Right. Uh, what we some people overplay a quotation, I forget from which Roman that uh, went into the temple. And supposedly went to the Holy Holies and you're surprised there's no image of their God because, you know, you raid any sort of people you took on, taken over, you find this golden image of their God in their temple. Right. Uh, but in, I forget who wrote this history, but it makes mention that in Antioch, one of the cherubim from the temple after it was ransacked was moved to Antioch because it's very common when you beat a country, you take some of their stuff and you bring it there. Just like Rome now has yeah. monoliths from Egypt. They have relics from Constantinople, just common thing from back then. And so that means even after the first temple was destroyed, without any explicit merit to say, go build cherubim, they went and built new cherubim because it continued to exist in Antioch. And so the Jews continue to make graven images, not 
idols, though. They and if you, and if you look what, at all the references to images of cherubim in the temple, you find that they were that the Old Testament temple was covered with images. It's just they were images of, of, of angels, not of saints. And that's because prior to the resurrection of Christ, heaven was not filled with uh, with the saints, but it was filled with angels. And the temple was a model, an image of heaven. Uh, but the walls were covered with cherubim. The doors were covered with cherubim. The, the curtains of the Holy of Holies were covered with cherubim. Uh, the outside of the Holy of Holies, there were two big cherubim. Inside the Holy of Holies, he had the Ark of the Covenant with two cherubim on top. The spoons had uh, had uh, cherubim on them, and they were everywhere you went. And, and so images were not the issue for, for, for the Jews in the Old Testament. Uh, and showing honor to holy things was not a problem. And Jews certainly did bow to the Ark of the Covenant, which had two images of cherubim on it. And, or, and matter of fact, the Psalms say, uh, worship the footstool of his feet. For, for it is holy. Well, the footstool of his feet in the context is very clearly the Ark of the Covenant. So people did bow to the Ark of the Covenant. So they bowing in the in, 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 toward something that had two big prominent images on it was not something that Jews had an issue with. So they tried to say, well, we, you shouldn't use images in worship. Well, what was that? I mean, you know, why were there images at all in the temple if, they, if we shouldn't have images in, in our worship? And it's just, it's radically inconsistent with documented history where we know the Jews continue to have images. We have archaeology. We have people stating they had statues of cherubim. Right. Uh, we have the veneration practices of relics in Judaism and the veneration practices of holy things. Uh, like uh, early thing in first century Christianity, they found out they put the Our Father in this like cryptographic kind of code and you put in front of your house like a talisman sort of. And so sort of like the mezuzah, which, by the way, also the the Samaritans still have. And so this is an issue that proceeds way before any split between Jews and Samaritans. Right. So venerating holy things was always there. There were always holy objects. And they venerated, connected those holy objects, the relics of those people. So it, it becomes this sort of torturous, well, you could do all this, but you just can't make a image of something that's holy and then venerate that. You could write about it and venerate it. You could take the bones and venerate it, but you just can't do that. And where's the historical evidence for this? Because contrary to their view, there is uh, evidence in Tertullian, in Hippolytus, uh, in Eusebius, and then also in St. Epiphanius, uh, that there was veneration of icons. What St. Epiphanius's comments are so specific that it was the vast majority practice. He spoke of people laughing at him and he was in the minority. Now, the reason why this doesn't get talked about more is simply because we don't like to air out these things about our saints. We don't like to say there was a saint that was laughed at. That's a forgery because it impugns them. But if, again, they're Protestants, they don't care about that. So if they're just looking at the history dispassionately, the actual written history specifically says the majority of people venerated these things. The archaeology brings this out. It's just not a consistent position. Uh, this By the way, on the, view. on the quotes from St. Epiphanius that supposedly attack icons, uh, there's, a, there's a book by Father uh, Stephen Bigham. And you could download an academia.edu for anyone that's uh, interested. And basically, it, it makes a very compelling case that it's a iconoclastic forgery. And that's what the fathers at the time of the Seventh Ecumenical Council said about it. So it's a questionable quote. But even if you accept that the quote is authentic, the fact of the matter is there were icons before St. Epiphanius and there were icons after St. Epiphanius. And uh, so there's not any evidence that that was a mainstream position. Uh, to, to reject images. And what and the thing is, St. Epiphanius didn't say you can keep this image of Christ, just don't venerate it. He destroyed it, if you accept the quote as accurate. Uh, and so the only way you could take that kind of, if you're going to use that kind of argumentation, you need to take the Amish position and just say we shouldn't have images of any kind of human beings. That would be the only, that would be the only tenable position if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna use that kind of argumentation, you can't even have your driver's license with your own picture on it because that's an image. You know, and Joshua Shooping sticky a a kind of silly argument about oh well, 
when you look into uh, Exodus 20 and the Septuagint, you cannot give proskuneo to images. And I pointed out, well, proskuneo just means prostrate, really, is a pretty good English translation of the term. Prostration is used all the time for different things. You, uh, you, there in First Samuel twenty, uh, I forget who was prostrated to, but people are prostrated to. It's it's a term that doesn't just mean strictly worship. You can mean it as worship, and obviously you can't do that to pagan idols. But you could prostrate to people, and in fact, Daniel ten fifteen, for all the all the stuff where people will quote, I think Revelation chapter nineteen, where he, um, where Saint John prostrates the angel the angel tells him not to and they go that's why you can't prostrate the angels well how why did the prophet daniel prostrate to an angel in daniel 10 15 they'll never they'll never look into it now this is not to show for me to give the answer if you wanted i could put it in the comment section but the point is the scriptures allow prostration and veneration of created beings and created things they they didn't uh -oh. tell people these specific geographic markers for piles of stones and tombs and and painting the tombs because people just were interested in their existence. They came to venerate these people. That's the point. Yeah, I have an article that's on orthodoxinfo.com called the Icon Fact FAQ. Frequently asked questions about icons, and in there I have it, it has a link to. Uh, two qu extended quotations that I wanted to have available for reference. And one of them is a quotation from the theological word book of the Old Testament. Uh, so you can look up all the ways that the Hebrew word that's translated as bow or worship in various places uh, is used. But Abraham bowed to the people of Hebron when he bought his uh, tomb for his wife, Sarah. Uh, and uh, there's a place, I think it's in Second Chronicles, where there's a uh, uh, the people are in the temple area and uh, it says they they worship the Lord and the king. And literally what it means is they bowed to the Lord and the king at the same time. So so if you're going to say that the word bow or your proskinesis, as it would have been translated in the Septuagint, that you can't do that to anything but God. Well, there's an example right there where the various word is used in reference to both God and the king. So they were showing honor to both God and the king. Worship is, is in, the, in the sense that most people use the word nowadays, is really sacrificial. And we don't sacrifice to icons. We, 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 don't, uh, we don't offer up chickens or anything like that to icons. Uh, and and that's we, a process to understand because they don't have liturgical, they don't have true liturgical worship. Right. right. The only, only Protestants confuse prayer and worship because they've rejected any kind of real sacrifice. The Eucharist, we believe, is the unbloodied sacrifice. We're offering, we're offering to uh, God what God offered to us. Of thine own, of thine own, we offer unto thee on behalf of all and for all. So, but but this is a sacrificial uh, service. We're offering Christ uh, to the Father. And um, you know, for for the remission of our sins, and uh, we're not, you know, Christ is not suffering afresh or anything like that. We're participating in the one sacrifice that Christ offered for us every time we partake of the Eucharist, and this is sacrificial worship. Uh, we don't do that to icons. Uh, you know, we we don't uh, we don't offer up the the Eucharist to icons, uh, and uh, so th there's where the distinction is. We venerate things. And another thing I in the comment section of that, that video that I've been talking to people about is Americans typically don't have a problem with venerating the American flag. No, Jehovah's yeah, Witnesses do. Our heart. Huh? The Jehovah's Witnesses do. They, they do, but most Protestants don't. And so we put our hands over our heart. If we're in the military, we salute. And we say the Pledge of Allegiance. And, uh, and so, you know, th this is a ritual that we do honoring the American flag all the time. And uh, most Protestants don't object to it. And, and what are we doing? Are we venerating a piece of cloth? No, the honor that we're paying to the flag passes on to the Republic for which it stands, you know, so, so that the, the honor goes off to what the, goes on to what the, 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 uh, the thing that we're venerating or, or showing honor to represents. And, uh, and then I had some Protestants say, well, you don't do this in church. Well, I, I'm pretty sure when I was growing up that we said the Pledge of Allegiance like on the 4th of July or something in a worship service. I, I, I kind of have that memory. 
But I, I, I remember for sure pledging allegiance to the Bible. <laughs> we had a Bible in front of, uh, in front of uh, my, you know, like Sunday school classes, and we would say, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet, and, uh, and I will hide its word in my heart that I might not sin against God. Uh, so we were, we were venerating the Bible when we did that. Now, it's, he alluded to major problems of this parish. And this is something where, I don't know, I've seen it enough places where I'm not going to point out at end. This is probably something a true concern. They call, the, they call some congregations priest eaters. You know, so such, such a term cannot be invented if there's not problematic parishes right. where Susie from the parish council calls all the shots. Right. Uh, they, I've heard priests being asked, well, why don't you shorten the liturgy? The other priests used to do this. The Catholics are out in 45 minutes. Right. Why are we doing it so long? And so, and then they just will pretty much eventually chase the priest out of town. Now it's, a, a, not with at what extent does it make it where someone could just go crazy, right? Like just like people hating you so much and they just go crazy. Now this maybe didn't happen to Joshua. Don't don't know him well enough, don't know his parish well enough. But he alluded to that. So how could this be a, a, how could this make the best person go nuts? <laughs> well, unfortunately, inside the Orthodox Church, people often treat other people badly. And uh you know, I've had some bad experiences with people in, in my life in the church since I became an Orthodox Christian. And things that grieved me a great deal grieved my family. Uh, but the thing is, you, you have to know that that's not the church's fault, that we have sinners inside the church that do things that they shouldn't do. Um, and, um, you know, one of the advantages about being a priest in Rokor is, 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 most priests in Rokor support themselves. <laughs> Tell them fly a and, and so you're never you're never at the mercy of a parish if they're if they're not paying all your bills. Uh, you know, it, it's nice when the parish supports the priest, and my parish, you know, does provide me a decent uh, stipend at this point in our church's history. Uh, but I still get a pension from the state of Texas too. So if they kick me out of my ear tomorrow, I wouldn't be, you know, begging uh, at the side of the road. You know, we'll work for food or anything. Uh, so you have a degree of independence when you're not dependent on the parish financially. And uh, unfortunately, if you are dependent, then people can take advantage of that, and that could be bad. And unfortunately, bishops don't always have the strength of character to support their priest, even when the priests are right. And uh, and so they, they'd rather throw the priest under the bus and keep the people in the parish happy than to make everybody in the parish mad at him and support the priest. So the, I, I don't discount that that could be a horrible thing to go through, uh, but uh, you have to have a, a commitment to the, your faith that, is deeper than, than, than something that's going to be shaken by that kind of an experience. I mean, you had, yeah. you had priests in Russia that were betrayed by former parishioners to the communists and they wound up being taken out and shot. Uh, you know, they're, they're in their, in the Roman period, there were people who apostatized and participated in the per persecution of the church. So you can't get much worse than, uh, you know, being delivered over to torture by, uh, you know, former parishioners uh, and being put to death. So none of that should shake the faith of a Christian. Now, my last, uh, my last question very briefly is just on his, his video on faith and works. He takes this narrow part from St. Uh, Ephraim, uh, from blessed Ephraim, Ephraim, blessed memory. And, he says, well, this shows that the Orthodox are just, uh, they've forsaken the gospel. They believe in merit-based salvation, et cetera, et cetera. Again, he should know better because he had a book with St. Philip of Moscow's Catechism, which is just emphatically against such a notion. And I just want to add this comment. If you have any comments, uh, please add yours, which would be, Ephraim is extremely difficult reading. I've been told, for example, if you can't handle this, put it down. Right, it's 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 for the aesthetically minded. It's it's not even I'd say many priests can't read this super well, and obviously he couldn't. Uh, I knew a priest personally 
who told me it's, you know, the, I said, what do you think of that book? And it's the one on uh, my elder Joseph the Hesychast. And I, and I said, what do you think of this book? Because I read the thing. And it was difficult reading. And I'm glad that I did. And he said, oh, it's a terrible book. Now he's a saint, <laughs> right? And so, right, this this recalling of his life is terrible. But now remembering him as a saint, it shows you so not everyone can handle this. And so how irresponsible it is to go to Protestants. Well, look at this ascetic work, which is really not made for like popular consumption, not without like going over spiritual father, what you're learning, what's trouble, what you're troubled by. Right. And say, well, this is why orthodoxy is bad. That's extremely disingenuous or, or just absurdly naive, right? He just didn't even know himself. You know, if there's someone in his congregation in this parish that needed, you know, support in reading this book and what it means, I guess he couldn't help them, you know? So it's, uh, I don't know. I just found it, Interesting that he focused on Ephraim specifically. I don't know if you have any comments. Well, what struck me about that particular video was is that it was odd that he didn't give any references to where he was getting the quote. So yeah, that, that people that could read the thing in context if they had the, the, the book. And then the other thing of it is you could take, you know, parables that Christ, get, get, you know, uh, delivered in the Gospels and uh, take them in isolation and say, well, this is teaching works righteousness. Uh, so you'd, you'd have to you'd have to make uh, he, Saint, the, the quote that he used, Saint Ephraim, I mean, your elder friend was using some sort of an illustration. But this, the, you, like I said, Christ used illustrations that focused on certain aspects of the gospel, like, well, the parable of the sheep and the goats. The only thing that separates the sheep and the goats are things that they do. There's no, there's nothing about uh, people repenting of their sins and, and accepting Christ by faith and uh, being saved by grace uh, through faith alone or anything like that. Uh, so if you just took that parable as all there was to the gospel, you could teach work to righteousness from that. But I'm pretty sure he wouldn't do that with Christ teaching. So it just seemed very disingenuous to me. And besides that, one thing I pointed out to him, because he used the word semi-Pelagian. He was saying that this is at least semi-Pelagian, if not Pelagian. Well, being a member of the Christian Mar Missionary Alliance now, I don't know if he's aware of it. But we're, he is now because I said it in the comments, but I don't know if he was aware of it before. But the ref all these Reformed theologians that he likes to read and quote from, they would say that people in the holiness movement are, are all semi-Pelagians. So welcome to the club, semi-Pelagian Joshua Shooping. It's, uh, in the end of the day, well, they're wrong too, right? There's a unity, but a false one, right? So as long as he's not fired from the job, I guess it's not an issue. It only becomes an issue if he can't do it there. And I don't mean to say that to be a jerk. I mean, that's what the fact of the matter is, right. you know? Um, so that aside, I want to end my comments before we get the audience questions on comments from a Protestant, all right? And he, and he, he gave me permission to read this, and I'll try to, if there's anything personal, I'll leave it out. But he said this. I watched the full interview with Gavin Ortlund. I was very surprised that Joshua seems to now fully embrace all the teaching of the Protestant Reformation without any concern. What a shift in his beliefs. Just so people know, um, this person has read one of Joshua Shooping's books. So right. it's not like he has no exposure to him. I'm sure that he has he was hurt not only with his local parish, but also from many other Orthodox priest critics because of his controversial book on soteriology. Penal substitution is really unpopular in many Orthodox circles. So they have pushed him to the limit in some way. This is his words. I'm just reading what someone right. wrote me. And this forced him to leave Orthodoxy. I can sympathize with him on that because I also feel the frustration to see all these Eastern Orthodox priests who deny penal substitution, guys, I'm quoting a Protestant, well, it's very clear there is in the Bible and even in their tradition, church fathers, council of Jerusalem, council of Jerusalem and catechisms, Peter Mogila, St. Philaret, as you show me very well previously. I can also sympathize with him about some extreme Eastern Orthodox teachings, like it is impossible to be called a Christian if you don't have a specific unleavened bread and communion or follow a certain specific calendar. It seems to me that these details deviate from the essence of the gospel. Again, this is a Protestant person's opinion. On the other side, I agree with you that it is hypocritical to say that he doesn't want to convert Orthodox Christians to Protestantism because he, by doing this kind of interview on YouTube, he's doing just that. I strongly disagree with him when he claims that the Protestants are not divided, but only distinctive. 
There's much, much more divisions in the Protestant evangelical world than in orthodoxy, and it's much more chaotic. And he will discover that very soon. I've been in both Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches in my life, and you'll almost never see a Pentecostal pastor invited to preach at a Baptist church and vice versa. Protestants are divided on many very important doctrinal issues, so how can he say they're united in Christ? At least orthodoxy enjoys for 2,000 years a communion with each other, with the exception of the recent split, the Greeks, the Russians, and has a solid common ground together the councils, the canons, the credo, and the catechisms. Concerning the facts that many Eastern Orthodox think Protestants are not Christians, well, it's the same on the other side. Many Protestants and Evangelicals think Eastern Orthodox and Catholics are not Christians at all. And even between the different Protestant sects and against each other, many of them think they are the only one true church, like the Church of Christ and the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. But there are many others. For a long time, the Pentecostals believed that the Christian who didn't speak in tongues didn't receive the Holy Spirit, so they're not Christians at all. In short, yes, I felt like he is now in an extreme reaction against orthodoxy, not being objective anymore, and he's trying to convince himself that the Protestant churches are the only true church and the teaching of the Reformation must be true. So I felt that was a very succinct comment from a Protestant, not from an Orthodox, and right. it was worth reading. And so that'd be my last word in the matter. Uh, before questions, uh, anything you'd like to add, Father? Well, one one thing I would say real quick, and that's that he, Joshua Shooping has brought up this uh, division, uh, contemporary division between the Russian church and the uh, ecumenical patriarchate over Ukraine. And it's actually not correct to say that we're not in communion with each other. We're not concelebrating with each other right now. And this is a form of an ecclesiastical protest. It could develop into a full blown schism. And when it does, only then will we really know who's going to be on what side of the line and who's going to be on the other side. Uh, and I hope it doesn't come to that point. But the thing is, if I have a Greek uh, layman that comes to my parish, I don't tell them they can't, can't take communion. I don't treat them like they're uh, outside of the church. And, uh, you know, it, our bishops will give a blessing to a layman to take communion in a uh, in a Greek parish or a Greek monastery under certain 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 circumstances, because, for example, if you if you have somebody who's in the military and the only way they could go to church at all would be to go to a Greek priest who's on base, uh, the bishop's not going to say well, it will be better for you not to go. Um, but uh, so so this th there is a problem, and there have always been problems in the church, and there are divisions. And this, it, this could develop into a full-blown schism, but it's not there yet. So you can't cite it as an example that the Orthodox Church isn't really in communion with each other because it's not really the case. Yeah, it's very much a reason theology sort of argument. And it's just in church history, we have examples of tangential communions where right. two large churches are not in communion, but they're both in communion with the third church. And obviously that's still the case now. But for episodes like we had in the past, like in ecumenism, it might reach the point where God's going to cut off the gangrene. You know, God permits right. evil for good reasons. So it's uh, right. so it may happen, but it may happen because how else are you going to prevent female ordination and some of the weird, wacky stuff but that yeah. may eventually come down the pike right. uh, amongst the liberals. So with some questions, we can't spend all night doing this. So we'll try to pick some of the best ones. Um Father, how often does apostasy happen among clergy and laity in your experience? Um, I think it's very rare among clergy. I, I can't think of another example of someone who actually left the faith that I knew uh, that was a priest. I've cer certainly known priests that left the priesthood uh, for various reasons, but not that left the faith altogether. Now, among laity, it's, I'd say it's fairly rare. Uh, you, you, it's, it's more common to have people who just kind of drift away and stop going to church, but they don't renounce their faith usually. Uh, I've, I've certainly seen it happen, and it's always a grief to see it happen, but it's not that common. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the main thing why people are shocked by this is not just the potential any of us, apart from the grace of God, could do something terrible. I mean, we all know that. 
it just more it breaks the narrative of what we're used to. It's freakish, right? It's always people converting to orthodoxy. It's very freakish right. for it to go the other way. So in some sense, and I want to be very careful I use that, it's good so people realize that, it, you know, the real world's not a cartoon where it just all goes perfect or just one way. We have right. to understand these things happen. We must take heed uh, lest we fall, as the scriptures say. Right. Um, we have this question. What does Father think about the manual uh, book, Manual Theosis by Shuping? Has he read it? Should I stop reading it? I haven't read it, but I would say given the direction the author has taken, it might be a good idea to set it aside. But I think if you read it and you read it carefully, knowing that there might be some stuff that's off, I think that would be a sin for you to read it. Yeah, I actually helped edit that book. And when I read it, I felt it was extremely good. But just like I presume the best from saints and whatnot, I presume the best from clergy, unless there's something explicitly wrong and it's doubled down, I'm going to read it in a orthodox light. And right. so having not reread it, I couldn't endorse its contents right now. And so I think until an orthodox source, Alexander, that you trust reads it and goes, well, no, here's the bad part. Or really, it is all good. There's none of this other crazy stuff on the radar there. It's just better not to read it at this point. Right. Uh, so I, it's just why take the chance until it could be scrutinized more thoroughly. And if you're reading it to learn it and not to scrutinize it, that's a dangerous place for you to be. Right. Um, so let's see. This is more of a rhetorical question. Does Shupi now reject theosis since Protestants could consider that pagan as well? My comment on this is what we're going to find is he's going to stop calling Saint uh, Simeon the New Theologian saint. Right. Like there's still some like shreds of orthodoxy there because, you know, you can't swim with the current so long. Then all of a sudden, 100 percent go the other direction. But my guess would be that will go away because he said he believed in the filioque, for example. And with it, it sounds to me he wasn't even reading um, the book on the filioque. I forget the guy out on Fordham University, uh, Sachensky. Um it doesn't even sound like he read it very carefully because Sanchensky's point was the filioque that St. Maximus talked about meant something very different than the filioque of Florence and the Protestants. Right. And so, like, just to say, oh, the the filioque has always been part of the church. Like, no, it really hasn't, and not how it's been dogmatized. So it's it's just extremely radical. How could you say it's a heresy and then come to embracing it? Uh, the, so ultimately, I think theosis, if you accept the filioque, what else will you ultimately accept? You know, so... Well, That's given that he's in a holiness denomination, the the holiness movement's teaching about entire sanctification has a lot of parallels with uh, theosis. As a matter of fact, John Wesley developed his theology based in large part on his reading of the Desert Fathers. And uh, so he probably can find ways to uh, hold on to the teaching even though he's he's obviously going to have to change certain aspects of it and and probably downplay, uh, he he certainly wouldn't be able to talk about it in the sacramental way that we would talk about it, uh, it to the same extent and and still uh, have uh, your typical holy roller say that that's okay. All right, now I'm trying to find it. You go through these questions, people going back and forth about all this stuff, and it's sort of hard. <laughs> Hard for me to find the question, guys, unless you ask a a good question. Um, you know, we got to go <laughs> do other stuff tonight uh, than this. So um, in the meantime, while I'm looking for questions, Father, could you please give people um, some plugs where people could find out more what you're up to, what you're doing? Well, I've got – you can go to stjonah.org, spelled out S-A-I-N-T dot – I mean, Saint, Saint without a dot, jonah.org. Uh, that's our parish website, and I've got a blog that in the article section, you'll find a link there. It's a blog spot, but you could just Google my name and you'd find it. Uh, and uh, got uh, sermons that are still on Ancient Faith Radio, and uh, you can listen to them there. But there's also the sermons on our parish archive. Um, as far as what's been going on, I should have mentioned my, uh, my older daughter had another baby on Saturday. Uh, so now I no, no longer have just a grandchild, but I have grandchildren. And uh, and our parish closed on two acres of land right next to our church today. And uh, so now we've got a lot more room to work with. 
were bursting at the seams. I right now have 24 catechumens. I've never had that many catechumens or even anything, anything close to it. And of those catechumens, there are two big families in there, but 11 of those catechumens are individuals that are not part of a bigger family. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we've had, we've had a lot going on and we've, we've, we're getting refugees from the West coast. And, uh, uh, so, um, our, we're running out of space and we're needing desperately to build a new church. That's one of the reasons why we bought the land next door. Are you still there, Craig? Cause I'm not seeing you on the screen. Well, well, if you're not on there, let me see if I can pull up the chat on my phone here. And that way I can take a look and see what kind of questions people have had until uh, Craig gets back on here. Chat on my phone. I mean, mute it so we don't have a uh, delay. Okay. Yeah, it is hard to pick out the questions here. Well, uh, Joseph Kerr, uh, congratulations to me on the granddaughter. Thank you. Uh, Shining Diamond says, notice me. Okay, hello, Shining Diamond. Um, it's now the Father John Whiteford show. There we go. I've taken over. Uh, <laughs> uh Ray Santo says that I'm a, a, a lot more tech savvy than other Orthodox priests. The funny thing about being tech savvy is, is that when my younger days, I used to laugh at uh, people like my mother who couldn't figure out how to do things. And I used to be the, the site uh, computer guy when I was in my job with the state of Texas. And I would try to walk people through problems. And I would say, now go to your desktop. And they'd say, what? You're talking about this desk in front of me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now I have to get my kids to explain how to use new gadgets to me. So eventually it's going to catch up with everybody. So Craig, I see you're back. Thank you for filling the dead air. My, my baby pulled out the internet. <laughs> so that's what happened. Um, so <laughs> it's, there, there was this question, Father, Father John, have you officially requisitioned the channel from Craig the layman? <laughs> um, no, I haven't. Uh, but uh, you, you could know, if you want. I'm looking for people to replace me. I don't want to do this forever. <laughs> <laughs> when is your channel coming online? Well, you know, with all the stuff that's been going on, it has has been making it difficult for me to get to my plan to start doing a video uh, uh, series on reader services. But I do still have that in mind to do. I've had other people telling me that I need to be doing shows more along the lines of what you're doing, but maybe just talking about theological issues, covering some of the same kind of topics that I do on my blog, because a lot of people are more inclined to watch a YouTube video these days than they are to read an article. Um, the problem is, is I'm, I mean, I'm, huh? the real danger is you could become almost like a televangelist because right. these days you've got good opinions and then you could monetize the question and answers and stuff. And before you know it, it's we're everything we ever hated, right? So it's uh, <laughs> well, the other thing real, is, I, I would love if I if I had the the know how, I would love to be able to do YouTube videos that had a lot of uh, PowerPoint stuff on there and all that kind of stuff. I'm just not that tech savvy. I, I imagine if I put my mind to it, I could figure it out. But I've just got so much on my plate. Uh, with uh, church and family that it's difficult. Uh, my, uh, my, my granddaughter and my, my son and daughter-in-law moved 500 yards away right before the baby was born. A couple That's weeks almost before. half a kilometer. <laughs> 500 yards. And uh, so I'm, I'm going through the five stages of grief being separated from my granddaughter, but uh uh, we're close enough to where I still am able to offer a lot of help to them. So that does take up a lot of my time. And plus, I, I have so many new people in my parish. We're, we're literally having to come up with ways to try to uh, maximize the space that we have until we're able to build a new church. Because 
it's like every weekend I've got new families that are coming and uh, we're, we're breaking barriers in terms of attendance that we, that we had before. And we normally have two chalices for communion because we have so many people communing and it's, it, it takes a very long time for one priest to commune all of these folks. So it's, it's, it's rough, but it's a good problem to have. No, it is a good problem. Uh, one last question for you, and then I'll, I'll give my plug for the Church of Cambodia, which is scrolling on the bottom, which is, Father, you brought up Cyprian against doctrinal diversity, but I remember his synodical letter affirming the right of individual bishops to make up their own mind on the issue. How do you read this? I'm not, I'm not sure that he really said that everybody gets to make up their own mind. Uh, uh, his one canon, you know, the, the, he had a council in Carthage and they issued one canon that was on the issue of baptism. And uh, he seemed to be pretty convinced that what he was saying was correct. And the church obviously agreed with him in principle or they wouldn't have affirmed that canon. But they also affirmed the first canon of St. Basil, which said that there is such a thing as economia. So I think what St. Cyprian's canon does is it states the principle that there are no grace-filled sacraments outside of the church. But St. Basil points out that the church has and can and does uh, accept sacraments that are performed outside of the church when their form is proper and then by economia by its reception, adding the grace that was lacking in those sacraments. And so, um, but but I don't think that St. Cyprian was saying everybody gets to decide for themselves uh, what they want to do. Now, yeah, my, my answer to the other Paul, who's a, a Protestant questioner, and I think he'll have his interview with Joshua Shooping. He's going through the whole circuit. Every Protestant uh, YouTube channel possible, Joshua Shooping appears to be willing to make a make an appearance but um, which is why, again, it compels us to do this video. But my answer to that would be, I think, uh, Paul, the issue more so is not that Cyprian thought everyone was right. He thought St. Stephen was wrong. That's what elicited the, the comment in the first paragraph of the, uh, of the baptismal ca baptism council. Rather, the issue was that because each bishop has to give an account to God, because that's what they actually say in the last sentence, that no bishop through, for, through tyrannical terror could, and I forget, he says after that, uh, pretty much oppress another bishop. So meaning each bishops give their own account, give their own teaching. Yeah. They should be the right one. That's the whole point of the council. That's why they then give 100 subscriptions and they all say the same thing. Um, but if they're wrong, they give an account to God. So I think that's more the point. I think what right. you may be trying to infer, how that somehow undercuts orthodox understanding of conciliarity is just actually kind of goes against the details actually in that paragraph and it shows that he was in the papers that's for sure well that see it, it's everything we want is is in that council everything we want so um other than that father i'll just say uh, i'm very grateful that you've come on we've discussed this i really i sort of hope that what we're going to see in the future will just be retreaded stuff um from joshua shooping or people associated with him dealing with it so that way this video won't have to be updated in any, any real way. It's for me, it's just for un, unlike uh, what your participation, which I'm very happy with Joshua Shooping's material has been very disappointing. doesn't seem like he's really read and looked at the stuff carefully. My recommendation to him is to do what let's say I've done, read the apostolic fathers, read all the second century fathers, take your time and read it. And then just ask yourself, who is this church in the second century? Who is this church in the first century? If we're going to read the Didache, we're going to read the scriptures, we're going to read St. Ignatius and stuff like that. Clement, I think my, he my, needs to read the sources. A yeah. lot of the stuff he's saying couldn't be said if he read the sources. And by commenting on stuff before he's read these sources, he's not only just hurting himself, he's hurting his family and he's hurting all the people found on YouTube hard, just hoping there's someone out there that studied this, that could allay their fears that maybe they're in schism and doing something wrong. And so at least if you're going to allay the fears of someone, do so with proper training and have properly looked at these issues. It's, it's very disappointing and tragic to see, um, you know, our love is for him. We hope that he repents 
We also hope that even if he does it, that he just dials back what he's doing because it's not good for anyone. He's not, he's not bringing facts to the table, which should encourage people differently. So all that being said, thank you so much, Father. God willing, uh, we get to do something again on a more positive topic. Well, let me just say this. My advice to Joshua Shooping would be, I think the best thing he could do would be to get a secular job and to stop teaching until he gives himself an opportunity to really sort out what he's doing. He's got a master's of divinity degree, which means that there's lots of jobs that you can get just because you've got a decent education. You don't, a lot of times. McDonald's to make $21 an hour. Probably right, better than being a pastor. But, but there, there are all kinds <laughs> of professional jobs. Like I was a child support officer. And before that I was working in the welfare department. There's no degree in, uh, in welfare or child support that you have to have to have those kinds of jobs and just take time to reflect because, you know, teachers are going to be held to the highest account. And if you're teaching air, then these are things you're going to have to answer for. And maybe you ought to take time to make sure that you're really teaching what you, you really believe before you go on and continue to teach these things. Yeah, my fear is, you know, that this is not all leading up to some major book and the idea is ultimately to sell books. I really fear that. Uh, I fear that for his sake. Hopefully he proves us all wrong. Right. But uh, we'll end on that downer, Father. Thank you again so much. And I'll end this show as I end all of them by quoting Jesus Sirach, who says, fight to death for the truth. And the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you all. Have a good night. Thank you.